Hello and welcome to Prism of the Past, a semi-weekly series about historical events, people, and situations from the fascinating to the forgotten. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to talk about the history of voice banks as well as get into the history of one of the most famous voice banks out there. Hatsune Miku. Vocaloid software is meant to provide a virtual singer for music production, but are these singers really able to emulate the emotion of a flesh and blood musician? Or are they blooming within the industry because they're flawless? Well, let's get right into it. If we start at the very beginning of voice banks or just machines meant to replicate human voice in general, we're gonna end up in the year 1779 when Russian professor Christian Kratzenstein developed a machine capable of generating the five long vowel sounds, A-E-I-O-U. It wasn't until 1961 when a machine sang though and New Jersey-based Bell Laboratory scientists had an IBM computer sing the song Daisy Bell, also known as Bicycle Built for Two. It sounds about as horrific as you would expect, like something from a sci-fi horror movie. Even so, not bad for a machine that's never had voice lessons, right? The IBM 7094 made history, and speaking of sci-fi, the science fiction novelist Arthur C. Clarke actually witnessed a demonstration for the piece while visiting his friend, the electric engineer and fellow sci-fi writer, John R. Pierce. According to my source, Clarke was so impressed that he incorporated the 7094's musical performance in the 1968 novel and the script for the 1968 film, 2001, A Space Odyssey. One of the first things that Clarke's fictional HAL 9000 computer had learned when it originally programmed was the song Daisy Bell. Near the end of the story, when the computer was being deactivated or put to sleep by astronaut Dave Bowman, it lost its mind and degenerated to singing Daisy Bell. Years later, around the late 90s, Jordi Bonata, a senior researcher at the Music Technology Group in Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona, began working on Project Elvis in a collaboration with Yamaha. The goal of Project Elvis was to make bad singers sound better in a karaoke booth. However, this system never became a product as it would require a recorded performance by a professional singer for every song, a massive undertaking. Instead, the company realized it would just be easier to record not just a song, but a set of vocal exercises with a great phonetics range. And from that, build a model capable of singing just about anything. Rather than correct existing singers, they could make the perfect vocalist. Bonata states, with that in mind, we agreed with Yamaha to start a new research project aimed at creating a singing synthesizer. That's when I met Hideki Kimochi the first time. Hideki Kimochi is known as the father of Vocaloid. Seven years after joining Yamaha in 1993, he found himself a part of this joint venture with singing synthesizer technology. According to my source, in Barcelona, the team had a few starting points to go from, most notably the Elvis project. One challenge was how to process and transform singer recordings so that it would result in a performance of a given song, sounding as natural as possible and providing the feeling of a continuous flow, Bonata says. The second challenge was how to process and transform the singer recordings so that it would result in a performance of a given song, sounding as natural as possible and providing the feeling of continuous flow. With that purpose, we devised a novel voice model, which allowed us to transform vocal timbers in a natural manner while preserving subtle details. In 2002, the prototype was officially named Vocaloid and as a code name, they called it Daisy. Although rough singing or rougher voices isn't really possible for a program as it's harder to detect pitches that way, the Vocaloid program could truly sing. Users could write lyrics, adjust various aspects of the voice like pitch and how syllables were delivered and go from there. All the team had to do now was figure out how to sell it. Sure, they could have made a voice library, but the variety would be limited. Instead, Yamaha decided to license the technology to third-party companies. Soon, everything began falling into place. Vocaloid was introduced to the world in 2003 at the German music trade show Musik Messe. In 2004, Vocaloid 1 became available to the public when British company Zero G purchased a license and released Leon and Lola. Their packaging features closed up on pictures of lips and some text, seemingly making it difficult for people to actually connect to these so-called singers. Sales were sluggish, poor even. One company, Krypton, designed a character named Meiko and stuck her on the front cover. Meiko certainly did better than her Leon and Lola counterparts, experiencing the most success of the Vocaloid 1 releases. Yet it was Vocaloid 2 and Krypton's second design that took the world by storm and led to none other than Hatsune Miku herself. Now, Vocaloid 2 changed things up a bit. 
Vocaloid 1 had only been based on analytics of a human voice, whereas Vocaloid 2 sampled actual human voices. This is something that greatly interested Wataru Sasaki, the importer of sound devices at Krypton. He not only designed the voice of Hatsune Miku, but recruited Saki Fujita, an anime voice actress, to have her voice samples create Miku in the first place. According to Sasaki, he did offer 10 singers with cute voices the role, but he couldn't come to terms with them as these vocalists were apprehensive about being cloned or having their original voice altered. That's why he chose a voice actress instead, as he believed they, and Saki, could better understand the concept of playing this anime character singer. In August 2007, Hatsune Miku officially arrived in stores. She was envisioned as an android diva from a futuristic time where songs are lost. Customers were almost immediately drawn to Hatsune Miku. Stores even sold out of the software. According to my source, one of the reasons for this is because Miku was a blank canvas. She was 16, just over five feet and almost 93 pounds. And she had her signature turquoise pigtails, of course, but that was about it. One of her most famous songs describes her as blue hair, blue tie, hiding in your Wi-Fi. Krypton allowed users to give Miku whatever personality they wanted. It played into an existing and extremely popular scene known as doujin community. The term refers to works of art, historically comics, that used pre-existing characters to create what amounts to fan fiction. Vocaloid tapped into this market and extended beyond just music. Visual artists and amateur music video makers were drawn to Hatsune Miku too. Krypton actively encouraged this character appropriation, creating the Pia Pro character license, allowing users to take Miku's image and do what they want with it, so long as it isn't for commercial gain. Naturally, there are some that interpret Miku differently because of this. Some men sexualize her, which is just, you know, creepy because she's 16 years old. One of my sources explains that the popularity of fictional characters like Miku could be due to the idealized female in Japan being meek, young, innocent, virginal all the things that Miku could be for someone that wanted it. Not to mention, it's not as if she could ever betray you. Even some of the Vocaloid producers sexualized her, like in later songs, Sweet Devil, where Miku is sexually active, asking the listeners, am I showing too much cleavage? You know you like it. And telling them not to be deluded, you're not the only boy I like. Another song, Gimme Gimme, describes her pretending to be drunk so that her lover will take her home, with the ending of the song hinting that she's cheating on someone. She also has a lesbian fan base, True Lesbians Love Miku, and there's a fan art trend called Fatsune Miku where people purposely draw Miku several sizes larger. That comes with the territory though, as the internet will be the internet. Whether for good or for bad, Miku can be absolutely anything. Some even want to straight up date her, though we aren't going to get into that today because again, she's 16. Hell, as a fun fact, when it came out that Notch, the creator of Minecraft was a, well, let's just say a less than savory person, people joked that they wanted Miku to be the creator of Minecraft instead. Miku was even later drawn in front of trans and other various pride flags and posted all over the internet as being part of the LGBTQ community. People could have her support because if they wanted to, why not? She was a blank canvas, yet an icon at the same time. Another reason credited to why Hatsune Miku became so popular at the time is because of the website Niko Niku Doga, which simply means smile videos. On Niko Niko, users can upload and share video clips like YouTube. However, comments were overlaid directly onto the video, then synced to a specific playback time. Musicians started uploading their original works to the site and one of the first ever Vocaloid communities emerged. Even some of the most well-known artists using Vocaloid in Japan, such as Hachioji first learned of Hatsune Miku through Niko Niko. Sasaki too largely credited the boom in this industry to Niko Niko, saying that people felt free to publish their own songs like a diary. After all, while otaku culture was starting to take off stateside, streaming sites like Niko Niko and YouTube were still in their infancy without the oversaturation and strict policies that content creators face today. Her songs were readily available and quickly eaten up and in a relatively short amount amount of time, Hatsune became a trailblazer. By September 2007, almost 3,000 copies of the Hatsune Miku software were sold. For reference, one of my Japanese sources at the time wrote that software such as this typically sells around 200 to 300 pieces, 
and it's considered to be a big hit if 1,000 copies sell. Hatsune Miku was reaching impossibly high numbers, and it's clear that Sasaki made the right decision going in this anime style direction. Hatsune Miku's voice fit in incredibly well with electronic music. She didn't and doesn't sound like a human voice, and it's been heavily altered and overproduced, nor like that sci-fi horror singing Daisy Bell. You could say that in the uncanny valley realm of voices, Hatsune Miku managed to avoid the valley for many, becoming the futuristic idol that Sasaki had intended. In an interview, Sasaki explained that while the success was more than expected, he didn't immediately try to capitalize on it. He states, quote, it wasn't long until we began to receive offers from the big Tokyo-based companies to make CDs of Hatsune Miku's songs or register her as an idol star with their studio. Japan's music world is centered almost completely on Tokyo, but we refuse these offers. Our company is based in Sapporo, you see. It's made up of people who are above all attached to the internet. Our idea was that it would be better to let Hatsune Miku spread via the internet as far as it would go, and then think about CDs, singers on contracts, and so forth. In a way, it was easier to refuse the offers, arguing that, well, we're based in Hokkaido, end quote. The patience paid off, of course, as Hatsune Miku had a lot of growing to still do. Now, before we continue on to take a look at some of the explosive growth that Hatsune Miku would would face through the internet, let's take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Honey. And Honey, as many of you know, is the app that helps you find coupons while you're shopping online. I've used them for many years, long before they sponsored me, and it's probably one of my favorite shopping tools. And here's how Honey works. Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite websites, and when you go to checkout, you just don't have any coupons. You look at that little promo code and you're like, damn, I wish I had something. Well, now you do. All you do now is you click the the honey button that drops down and just hit apply coupons, wait a couple seconds, let them figure it out. Like they know if the coupon works or not and then they apply it to your cart. And that's easy, you save money. It's that easy. I've literally used them for years. They saved me thousands of dollars. I like, it has to be thousands of dollars. Like I shop for everything online and they've been there with me the whole way. So if you don't already have honey, you could just be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you're doing a self a solid and you're supporting the channel. So. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash prism. Again, that's joinhoney.com slash prism. This past year has taught us to savor every moment together, to spend less time prepping and cooking and more time with the people you love. And that can be done with the help of DoorDash. Perhaps this is the night you're too tired for a home cooked meal, but you don't wanna go to the store either. Or maybe you just wanna try something exciting and new, but it would be great to stay in tonight. Well, DoorDash connects you with everything you could ever want and need. Along with restaurants you love, you can now get groceries and other essential items delivered with DoorDash. Get drinks, snacks, and other household items delivered in under an hour. And with over 300,000 partners, you can support your neighborhood go-tos or choose from your favorite national restaurants. Ordering is easy and your items will be left safely outside your door when you choose contactless delivery drop-off. For a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter code PRISM. That's 25% off up to $10 in value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the app store and enter code PRISM. Don't forget, that's code PRISM for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. By July of 2008, the Hatsune Miku software was selling about 300 copies a week with over 40,000 sold by that point. The second characters released by Krypton, Kagamine, Rin Len released in December, 2007, and they also did incredibly well, selling about 20,000 units. Even though her songs were sometimes criticized for not being soulful in the way a person's song would be, many still enjoyed the electronic music and even the merchandise. Music retailers like Tower Records Japan opened up sections devoted to vocal aid music in their stores and the convenience store chain Family Mart ran multiple campaigns. Due to popular demand, Hatsune had her first onstage debut in August, 2009. A compilation featuring her voice, Exit Tunes Presents Vocal Genesis featured Hatsune Miku became the first vocal aid album to top the charts when it debuted in May, 2010. Hatsune's voice was also used on the original version of the Neon Cat song, which was uploaded to the Japanese video site Nico Nico that July. I really can't understate the amount 
massive impact and success Miku has had. Sony Music Direct Japan began selling the Japanese pop brand's Supercell single, The World Is Mine, featuring Hatsune Miku on Apple iTunes American Store in 2011. And soon it reached number seven in the top 10 singles chart for world music. It became Amazon's 56th best-selling MP3 in the international category in the United States. The car maker Toyota used the song for an online American commercial too, further spreading Miku into the West. Anime Expo also announced that Hatsune Miku would perform a concert at their event that year in LA as well. Of course, at this point, anime such as Cowboy Bebop had become incredibly popular in the States, so anime fans on the hunt for content would have been receptive to someone like Hatsune Miku. Aside from growth in terms of money and sales though, Hatsune Miku had a massive cultural impact as well. The Japan Times wrote in 2007 that despite Hatsune Miku's software being only 10 years old, her ascendance in Japan predicted the direction that a lot of music would go. Their article reads, this brave new world was hinted at a few months ago before Miku arrived by electro pop trio Perfumes breakthrough into the J-pop mainstream. The group second with vocals dunked in autotune was created by Yasutaka Nakata, a producer who managed everything from his home studio. The rise of Vocaloid music signaled that people genuinely wanted these electronic sounds, as well as the ease of doing everything from a computer. As a result of her rise in popularity, there's a whole generation of new up and coming artists whose introduction to music making came via Vocaloid. The Japan Times gives examples of EDM leaning pop artist Real and the singer songwriter Kenshi Tansu, who started writing music using Vocaloid software in 2009 under the name Hachi. On the same note, Hatsune Miku allowed anyone with the software to express themselves and share their skills with others. For many fans, that meaningful participation, finding a community, creating art, music, and this collaboration also speaks to the impact Hatsune Miku had. She, in a way, brought people together as more than listeners, but creators. Sure, while the hologram aspect of Miku is interesting and gets a lot of attention, it's the fact that all her music, including the songs performed in concert, is written by her fans. Some of them can't even read music and never felt empowered to write a song before Miku came along. Vulture interviewed Tara Knight, a professor at UC San Diego in 2014, while she was working on a documentary about Miku. Tara states that when she meets Miku fans, we all have this giddy joy like we made this, we're part of this thing. Vocaloid is also a logical extension of the the way digital culture has altered pop stardom by making the fans more visible. Think Little Monsters, Beliebers, and Swifties, along with their leader's refrains. It's all about my fans. I only do this for my fans. Miku takes this belief that fans are responsible for their artist commercial successes one step further. Fans are responsible for her creative successes too. You don't have to wait for her to release her next single. You can write your own or direct the music video or choreograph a Miku dance or translate the single into another language. Not to mention, as a result of Sasaki's early decisions, he was able to make money without appearing greedy or extorting control over the fans, allowing this community to truly flourish. One source explains that, Miku is proof that you can strike the right balance between control and collaboration. For the vast majority of works created using the character, Krypton doesn't receive any money. Artists don't have to pay royalties to use Miku's voice, even for commercial purposes, as long as they legally obtain the software after they can use her image for non-commercial purposes without permission from the company. However, Krypton sees plenty of profit from merchandising and endorsement deals. As a result of this, the biggest controversies surrounding Miku aren't really about money. Instead, when a Japanese politician once tried to use a Miku song for their campaign, it created a massive backlash. Likewise, when Miku was featured on that Toyota ad we mentioned earlier, it only alienated the community they were trying to engage. Apparently in the campaign artwork, Miku was drawn less cutesy and more westernized, so the community didn't promote it, and the campaign was largely considered a failure. Whether or not you're part of that community, there's no denying the impact Tatsune Miku has had across the world. She's open for Lady Gaga, debuted on The Late Show with David Letterman, and headlined two shows with the Hammerstein Ballroom. She was even supposed to debut in Coachella in 2020. One New York Times headline has questioned if her rise means the end of music as we know. And while I don't believe that's true, I do think Hatsune Miku has changed EDM music as we know it, and she's affected the industry as a whole. She continues to make headlines to this day, as Krypton Future Media, Graphic India, and Carlin West Agency recently announced that they're developing an animated series featuring Miku. Naturally, with the success of Miku, other companies wanted to follow suit. Utau is another well-known voice synthesizer, though it's not nearly as well-known as Vocaloid. It was released in 2008 and is free to use. Though similar, the key differences are in their voice banks. Vocaloids are made by studios that are licensed by Yamaha. Vocaloid uses vocal phonetics for a wide range of possibilities, but Utau is self-developed. 
In other words, you have to make your own voice bank. You can't buy Miku's voice bank or other characters, but you can create your own. Utawu seems better suited to hobbyists according to the reviews I found. And as Utawu progressed, better and better Utabloids appeared. Even though they may not be as massive as Vocaloid, it gave vocal synthesizers even more accessibility to people that wanted to use them. Lucia and Luan were also new Vocaloids created after Miku exploded onto the scene. They were two Spanish Vocaloid programs programmed by the artist Giuseppe. From what I can gather, Lucia was considered to be too similar to Vocaloid 3 Clara, which led to quite a few complaints about the diversity of voice banks in the Spanish speaking fandom. Apparently, Giuseppe was irate at all the criticism and lashed out at these fans, insulting their tastes and credibility. His comments and Luan's demo were both eventually deleted and he withdrew from the Vocaloid fandom as a whole. Other Vocaloids such as Leon and Lola from earlier, and I know it's a lot of L names, were both sampled from black vocalists and yet Leon and Lola themselves are depicted as white. Again, this feeds into the real lack of multicultural representation within Vocaloid. This isn't the only issue people have had with Vocaloid when it comes to race, as some claim that the Japanese Vocaloid fandom has shown incredibly racist behaviors. Chinese and Korean producers like Solpai and Siyu have been attacked on Nico Nico when trying to upload their work. The Colorado Journal of Asian Studies reads, for some, Hatsune Miku is very much a symbol of Japanese Japanese national identity. Japanese fans are proud of their virtual diva, so much so that racial tension has come about in response to certain events. For instance, one Chinese user uploaded a song he composed to Nico Nico. This song, Moon West River, is sung completely in Chinese. It features a soft tune highly reminiscent of traditional Chinese music. The composer, Solfi, was the target of many malicious comments as a result of the release of this song. That Hatsune Miku would be made to sing in Chinese offended the sensibilities of these users, and Sofi received many racist comments on Nico Nico. Mainstream Japan, a mostly homogenous society, is still relatively unaccepting of foreign presence within its borders. This is mostly only applicable to other East Asian peoples as Japanese producers will occasionally use English in their songs. In another example, one malicious user tried to have a ton of Miku videos banned from YouTube en masse making false copyright claims. As I'm sure plenty of you know, YouTube will remove videos that are copyright claimed relatively easily, even if there isn't much evidence to substantiate those claims. When this happened, Japanese users demonized Korean users, accusing them of being the culprit with no evidence. Even though all the videos were restored or re-uploaded without issue, the fact that Korean fans were so innately blamed says a lot about the mindset of these specific Japanese fans. I don't wanna paint everyone with the same brush and say that all Japanese fans of Miku act this way, but it's been quite a few and quite consistent and it's disappointing to say the least. Miku is for everyone, that's why she was created. You can be proud of and protect something your country has created without being cruel to international people that benefit from it. Generally speaking, despite these occasional controversies, the Vocaloid community was strong and flourishing during this golden age of Vocaloid during the early 2010s. I actually found a fantastic spreadsheet from Reddit user Pomper1 that compiles every historically significant and popular Vocaloid song. It starts with the release of Miku in 2007 up until this list was posted in 2018. It's obviously not every single song, but the most defining songs that shaped the Vocaloid culture as a whole. Now, it's not to say that Miku isn't still incredibly popular now, the era isn't entirely over, but the novelty has worn off to some extent. The community of fans are still going strong, whether or not Vocaloid and Miku get the same amount of attention. Now, last but definitely not least are the producers. After all, Miku is the star of the show, the singer, the figurine, and the face of Vocaloid. The producers truly do the work behind the scenes though. One of these many, many producers was named Wowaka. He was one of the founders of Ballroom Record Label, founded in 2011. His songs were some of the most popular. The song Front and Back Lovers got over 700,000 plays when Miku was still new. In a 2007 interview, Wobaka said that he owed Miku for him getting into music. I heard the theme for the Miku anniversary compilation is gratitude, but personally, I made a song themed around love, Wobaka said. It's a bit embarrassing to say, but this is the first song I've ever made in my life themed around love. I never gave it a second of thought 10 years ago as I posted songs, but no matter how you look at it, Hatsune Miku is the one who got me to start music. Miku is sort of like a mother figure to me. Yet, despite Wowaka's legacy as a talented Vocaloid producer, some have wondered if Wowaka actually did want more from the Vocaloid community. In 2011, Wowaka wrote the song Unhappy Refrain before taking a break from the community. Then his song Unknown Mother Goose, released in 2017, was his last release before passing away from acute heart failure. In the English translation of the song, it reads, all the feelings people have ignored will now live on. 
As for you, tell me what you would want differently. Honestly, can you see me through the screen? Some have speculated that Wawaka wanted people to see him as a musician, not just Miku. This too has been a consistent problem within the community. In May of this year, users have posted suggesting that they make a rule that producers should be credited. You can't say a song is by Hatsune Miku, for example, as obviously she didn't make it. Without a doubt, this is a labor of love for these producers. They pay for the software, write these lyrics, this melody, this entire song without any payment, and they only make money if the music does well. The least they deserve is credit. Though some might see it as Hatsune Miku's latest song, it truly isn't. Many famous artists like Ariana Grande, 21 Pilots, and One Republic don't always write their own music. However, the songwriters they hire will be paid, at least I sure hope they will. So these Miku producers have no idea if they'll actually even get money for the time and effort they put into these pieces. It's not hard to see why then, this could be a point of contention if the bare minimum crediting wasn't or isn't happening. I guess all that I can say is that if you do like a song Miku sings, take an extra minute to Google the producer. Maybe give them a follow on Twitter, buy their album, or tell them thanks for their hard work. More than ever, this truly is a labor of love, and I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Miku has inspired music. She's had commercial success, and she's inspired virtual personalities as a whole. One Medium article writes, with the advancement of computer vision technologies, a new group of virtual characters is emerging to push the boundaries even further than those that Hatsune Miku has established. These new digital characters can talk, move, walk around, and unlike Hatsune Miku, even interact live with other performers. They are called virtual YouTubers or VTubers as their live videos are mainly published on YouTube, at least so far. And they are much like other human YouTube hosts or personalities, just digital. Kizuna Ai, a pioneer in this field, started to appear on YouTube in December, 2016. It's not a coincidence that it was around this time when high-end VR headsets were beginning to be delivered into the hands of consumers. As these virtual characters need motion and facial capture devices to live stream their performances. Again, this isn't to say that VTubers wouldn't exist without Miku, but I would argue that her era absolutely inspired them, EDM music, and multiple facets of the entertainment industry. And hey, whether you love or hate Miku, that's up to you. I never realized what a collaborative community was even behind Miku, and I think it's fascinating how one true voice can bring so many together. But with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of Prism of the Past. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. Again, thank you so much for making it to the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thank you.